Well, hello there, and welcome back to Watchbox Studios. This is Watches Tonight. I am your host, Tim Masso. It is that time of the year because this evening we are predicting the near future for Rolex watches at Watches and Wonders 2021. We are chatting live, hearing your opinions, your predictions, as well as mine. And of course, I'm sharing your viewer wrist chats right here on Watches Tonight. Eddie Landsberg in the box, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Mr. No Date, Marco Bernardi, Richard Combs of South Florida, Blue Shirt Buddha. Enrique is in the box with Mateo and Geezer and Mark and Joe. Welcome, guys. Remember to check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com. It's where you can find last year's Rolex novelties right now. And, of course, I'm not really about Rolex. I'm about Dipatoon, so I put them there. I'm the king of the show. I get to do that. And... Upcoming adventures on the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group. It's sort of the unofficial after party to watch us tonight. But we are Talking Time with Tim Masso. First, live reactions to the Rolex launches this coming Wednesday, 5 p.m. Wednesday evening. I will be chatting live on the Facebook group. I am also going to be airing podcasts of my upcoming talk with watch and car expert Drew Koblitz, a good friend of the show. He's previously done a collector conversation. We're coming back with his new cars and his new watches since then. And we will be hosting a talk with watch collector and entrepreneur Blake Machado of Cars and Bids. All of that on Talking Time with Tim Masso, only on Facebook. All right, while we filter in for this Rolex-centric episode of Watches Tonight, let's talk a little bit about Audemars Piguet instead. Why? Because I can. So, there's a new Code 1159 chronograph, and this one combines the 41 millimeter chronograph model in rose or white gold with a new black ceramic mid-case ring that gives it a nice tone-on-tone -tone look without actually going steel gold or gold titanium. It's an impressive looking thing that comes paired with a new dial, a vertically brushed metallic grain that uses the Oso oh Vogish Fume fade. Not invented by Moser, but definitely popularized by them in the modern era. This watch frankly looks good. And not just good, I would say compared to the 1159 as it debuted in 2019, it looks great. Whether it'll be enough to convince people to reconsider their initial assumptions about this model line, I can't say, but things are looking up. All right, 95th Phantom, MCC Le Chinois, John N, Terry C, Patrick R, Vincent P, Wolfgang Kohler joining in from Austria and continental Europe, Baltimore Spirits Co. We got Simon Holt joining in with Lloyd Kerr and Alex O with Scott W. Guys, welcome to the show. Tonight we are talking Rolex. And before we do, guys... Let's talk about yours, including some Rolex watches. All right, viewer wrist shots number one. I asked you, answered, Conrad hits the road with his Ferrari 488 and Rolex Submariner two-tone, very on topic and timely. Randy and his Bulgari Octofinissimo skeleton complement his Porsche 911 GT3. Marco M and his Patek Philippe 5960p annual calendar flyback chronograph showcase a different type of watches and wheels with his giant DeFi road bike. Raphael C. is a sharp-dressed man, QZZ top, with his Patek Philippe 5205-13, and impeccable attire. That's one for the record books right there. We're talking Hall of Fame. Carlos in Puerto Rico stuns with his blue Vacheron Constantin overseas chronograph and a lovely twilight moment. Well captured, especially with the backlight watch still getting the dial details. Very well done, Carlos. Okay, Rolex predictions for 2021. Um, my annual guest fest starts right now. That's from the current Rolex website. They're not being coy. New watches are coming in 48 hours. What are we going to get? I don't know for sure, but I can use my educated guessing ability to look into the crystal ball or the Bird Valle crystal ball. Let's see, do we have that? There it is behind me. And uh, we will prognosticate. Okay, so this is now a hallowed watch box tradition where I guess what Rolex is going to do each year. My annual pre-release Rolex model forecast reaches new heights of audacity, absurdity, and granularity for 2021. Uh, this year is the first in which Rolex has planned in advance to launch outside of Baselworld. Its cancellation of Baselworld last year was kind of late breaking. This is the first time Rolex has gone into a new model year specifically knowing it's not going to have Baselworld or even a physical trade show to launch its new models. So this is going to be entirely virtual and a little bit experimental, which is something Rolex doesn't often do. I will also say my forecast arrives in three tranches. First, the likely, things I really believe will happen. Second, the possible, things that could happen. And third, 
fantasy. And that's pretty much pie in the sky. What could Rolex do if they were as crazy as I am? Any of these predictions or more could come true or none could. That's the fun of it. Throughout this episode, I want to read your Rolex wishes and predictions in the chat box because this is going to be our most interactive show of the year and I want to hear what you have to say. Let's see what's going on. Victor from Toronto. We've got Tiffany Dell predicting perhaps a new Cellini. I like the sound of that. Something's going to change in Cellini land, that's for sure. And right here, Baltimore Spirits. I predict the new Explorer 2 will match your jacket. Hey, a green dial Explorer 2? I would love to see that. I think that's pie in the sky, but hey, it's at least possible. We've seen green anniversary watches in the GMT and Submariner model lines. We've got Simon Holt joining in from... Hollywood, Northern Ireland. I was from Hollywood, Florida. We've all lived in places called Hollywood that are not in LA. And then right here, we've got Showcase Watches saying, please discontinue the Panda Rolex. I just got one. And then Andrea saying, Meteorite Platinum Dial Explorer 2, or Platinum Meteorite Dial Explorer 2. All good ideas. We've got Akayo joining in from Rio, Brazil, saying Explorer 1 in 41 millimeters and restoration of the original 36 millimeter option. Let's see. First, I'm going to predict the gimmies and the easy ones right here. So let's start with the Submariner, the Sea Dweller, and the GMT. All of them have been redesigned since 2017, which is to say the best you can expect is some kind of variation. There will not be new model lines for any of these core Rolex families. I will say this, the current generation Daytona is officially ancient. Its first Full redesign since 2000, however, is more likely to occur in two years, as Rolex will have a 60th anniversary to celebrate. Uh, it's important to remember that Rolex is big on anniversaries. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but the watch is selling at such a torrid pace, there's no need for a redesign. And I feel like with only two years to go until the watch can officially mark our new chapter and a 10-year milestone, Rolex isn't going to do anything with the Daytona this year. Watch this space, because in 24 months we may be speaking differently. Now, the Cellini line the dress watches. This is the bete noir of Rolex management. This is the collection, nicely made, thoughtfully conceived, attractively designed, and well-built, that never seems to capture the imagination or the pocketbooks of watch collectors. Uh, I think we're going to see major reductions in the model line or significant revisions. Let's face it, for all the effort Rolex has put into Cellini just since 2014, the watches generate nowhere near the interest of Rolex's own sports watches, including Rolex sports watches in precious metal, which a lot of folks just consider to be the dress models in Rolex's collection. Day dates, date justs, in gold, in platinum, people buy those as the Rolex dress watch and they forget about these. Now, moreover, Cellini doesn't seem to generate the interest commanded by specialist dress watch companies that, that are success stories with dress watches. They could be as small as Philippe Dufour, Carrie Voudelainen, or F.P. Journe, or as large as Patek Philippe. But here's the thing. For all the effort and the money spent, Rolex can't seem to propel itself into that echelon of interest and esteem where dress watches are concerned. So, I'll also mention that resale isn't up to Rolex standards. Rolex Cellini Prince models that sold for the equivalent of $20,000 in today's money back in the 2000s, today they sell for less than $10,000 in today's money. And that's just not a success story. And for all the talk of Rolex marketing muscle, this doesn't seem to be a challenge that budget alone can overcome. There's an idea deficit here, and I think really Rolex knows that and needs to hit the reboot button, and maybe even take some time between discontinuing the old Cellinis and launching new ones to think about what it wants the Cellini line to be, and whether, frankly, Cellini needs to be a mass market watch. It might be that 1,000 spectacular hand-finished display caseback Cellini dress watches a year is all Rolex needs as an image builder, and frankly, all the market wants. So I'll say this. Even unsponsored use by an American president, Barack Obama, and the well-received 2017 Cellini moon phase hasn't awakened demand. So I suspect we will see somewhere between most and all Cellini watches retired with the possible continuation exclusively of this model right here. So, 
Rolex could also double down and relaunch the entire line with integrated bracelets, steel cases, and green dials because that's how tastes roll in 2021. But I don't think they'd do that. That's just too easy, too obvious, and frankly, I think there would be a backlash. So Cellini, you are on thin ice right now. I would also say this. Rolex has a genuine Gerald Genta design in its product back catalog if it chooses to use it. By most expert consensus, the 5100, and we'll talk about it more later, from 1970 was designed by Gerald Genta. And Genta, indirectly commenting on the oyster quartz, considered that to be a continuation of his design. Rolex, a revival of that shape with a mechanical movement, and all could be forgiven. That might be what Cellini should be in the year 2022. For 2021, I can't say for sure. Now, moving on, Rolex does anniversaries. My God, does Rolex do anniversaries. There was the 2003 50th anniversary Submariner. There was the 2005 50th anniversary GMT. There was the 2013 50th anniversary Daytona. And there was the 2017 50th anniversary Sea Dweller. Naturally, dramatic pause, I expect there to be a 50th anniversary Explorer too. I don't expect it to look exactly like this. Let's jump into the chat box before we delve into the Explorer 2. MCC Le Chinois saying, I like idea deficit to describe what's been wrong with the Cellini line. Showcase watches, Explorer 2 with polar dial, black ceramic bezel, and green GMT hand is as fancy as Rolex will go with the watch, I think. Simon Holt opining, Rolex Cellini cannot compete on movement and finishing versus Patek Calatrava, IWC Portugieser, Vacheron Constantin, Patrimony, Longa, and so on. Can't compete for now, but you really think if Rolex wanted to, it couldn't. What else are you guys saying? We've got often licked. I would love Rolex bringing back the display case back with better finishing for Cellini. That sounds super interesting. Also would love a relaunch of the Oyster Quartz, but that's a pipe dream. I probably agree with you right there. Abdul saying, I imagine a Cellini with a triple calendar and a moon phase with a 100 meter water resistance and integrated bracelet. I like where you're going with that right there. And right here we have Captain Zed joining us saying hello. Hello, Captain Zed. Welcome back. And we've got Baltimore spirits coat. Let me see if I can find your comment because this chat box is moving fast saying I'd love to see the 5100 and the Genta Ingenieur from IWC make a return this year. You and me both. Dr. Stu, 50th anniversary Explorer 2 will move to 41 millimeter case but it should keep steel bezel and have green anniversary GMT hand please. Al Hashimi joining in along with showcase watches. We've got Armo and Tim S. I would love to see wooden dials back again. Again, I like the way you guys think. You are the best audience on YouTube. So here's what I think the 50th anniversary Explorer 2 is going to look like. The Oyster Perpetual and the sub went 41 millimeters last year. I expect, since there's also a 41 millimeter date just, that the Explorer 2, which was a little bit too big as a 42, is going to join the growing ranks of 41 millimeter Rolex watches. I also suspect that it will be smaller than it is now, but bigger than it was in the five digit era. So if you want a full return to 40 millimeters, I think you will be unfulfilled. I expect for historic reasons that the black dial model, the apocryphally named Steve McQueen, will remain in the collection. That said, I also suspect that Rolex will take some measures to better conform this watch uh, in terms of the dial, which will be, I think, matte black, uh, the seconds hand, which I think will be a, a needle style without the lollipop bob, and the bezel, I think all of this, along with the orange arrow 24-hour hand, will more closely hew to the distinctive first year 1971 Explorer 2. Look at that, scale it up, modernize it, and I think you've got the general idea. Now, the fate of the Explorer 2 polar dial could be more interesting. And this is where Rolex has a chance to hit a home run. If you thought the Sub and the Daytona and the GMT were waitlisted, just wait until Rolex, and I am hoping against hope here, but I'm hoping that Rolex chooses to reference the most famous of all light colored dial Explorer 2s by recalling the first dual time Explorer 2, the mid 80s transitional reference 16550. And yes, I want it with cloudy, unrhodium plated hands 
and indices with a cream lacquer dial. Now the cream dial was a little bit of an accidental look back in the 80s. Rolex didn't know how it would age and Fortuitously, it aged beautifully. These things are now absolutely collectible in a way few transitional Rolex watches currently are. That's still a buyer's market. This watch has already moved. I will also say this. If you're going to do the cream dial Rolex, also give us the, the gray unrhodium plated white gold hands and indices. If, if you look at the silvery shine on Rolex white gold hands today, it's not the white gold that gives them that, that color. It's the rhodium plating on the white gold. This has a cloudy gray aesthetic to the hands and indices, which is part and parcel to the look of the cream dial. And if you really want to zing me Rolex, give me a buck toothed rail dial with the split text at six o'clock and I will be in horological heaven. Now, I will also say I hope that Rolex resists the temptation to equip the new Explorer 2 with a ceramic bezel of any kind. Because the radial brushed steel die or bezel with lacquered scale, that, that radially brushed lapping machine pattern, uh, I really think is core to the identity of this watch which has always worn its 70s origins on its sleeve as, as a mark of honor, a badge of honor. And I really think that brushed metal lacquered numeral dial has to stay. The only way I could see an exception is if somehow Rolex finds a way to do this in ceramic without changing the look. If it's indistinguishable from metal, I'm cool. If they're going to put a black or brown ceramic bezel on this watch, I'm not cool and I don't want it. Now, I will also say, hopefully last year's successful Oyster Perpetual redesign is indicative of a company that recognizes the incompatibility of ceramic case components with certain of its famous model families. Let's jump in the box and see what you guys are saying right here. Why Moon saying no ceramic on the Explorer, sign the petition. Right here we have Captain Z asking, what's the chance Rolex intros a Sea Dweller chronograph? I would say the chance is 5% because I've always thought Rolex needed a diving chronograph and that model line is now, let's see, one, two, three, four model years old. I think it's reasonable that it could get a mid-cycle update with the addition of a chronograph to the model line, but we already have two Sea Dweller models and I'm not sure that we need an additional one with a complication. This year, frankly, is going to be all about the Explorer 2 and if it's not, I will be shocked. So the first ever Rolex diving chronograph would be kind of a big deal. So if only to avoid overshadowing the star of the show, I don't think we'll see that this year, but you can write this down. There will someday be a Rolex diving chronograph. Uh, let's see what else. Do, 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 do. Z pigs and blankets. What are they going to do about the Explorer? In my opinion, smaller cream dial and a 70 hour movement. We might get a green 24 hour hand as a special edition. That's something based on the history of the GMT Master 2 we can safely say is within the realm of possibility and probably probability. Okay, right here. Let's see what else you guys are saying. Da, da, da. Showcase watches. What about 39 millimeter Explorer 1? Is it getting updated? It might, but I don't think it will. If anything, I can see the addition of a 36 millimeter traditional Explorer, which might replace the 39 millimeter Explorer, because frankly, between the Milgauss, the Oyster Perpetual 41, the Air King, and the Explorer, there are too many 39 to 41 millimeter steel three hand no date Rolex sports watches. It's a log jam in style, size, and price and frankly I think one of them is going to get the axe this year but I don't think it's going to be the Explorer. All right, viewer wrist shots number two. I asked, you answered. We are talking about your watches in my box. Marceau are getting up close and personal with his Panerai Radimir 1940 GMT from Watchbox. Thank you for trusting our company, Marceau. Brendan K from Hong Kong rings in the Easter holiday with his Jager Le Coult tribute to Polaris and judging by the orange indices, that that might be one of the very earliest examples of the tribute to Polaris. Edward B impresses with his Norfolk built, UK crafted, full guilloche dial option, Garrick S4 and a stiff drink during a night on the town. I love Garrick. Ahmad A and his Rolex GMT Master 2 two-tone are out walking the dog this early spring. Pero B and his Omega Speedmaster Professional celebrate Easter with a cactus bunny in the background. Not as tasty or as palatable as chocolate, I'm going to say, right out of the gate. Edwin C. of Singapore lights up the screen with his Calibre de Cartier with rose gold bezel in front of a Tudor display. There you go. 
Guys, wrist shots, Monday mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send them to me to see your watches, or as I like to say, your wrist on my list. Okay. Now, the Milgauss, this is another one of those likely things. A phase out, either just the Z Blue model, which has long been rumored, or the entire collection. Ah, but you say, this is the year of the Explorer 2, and Tim, didn't you just say Rolex doesn't want to outshine the birthday boy with a highlight watch, like, for example, a new Milgauss or a chronograph diver? Yes. And certainly Rolex doesn't intend to relaunch two full model lines this year. So you're not gonna see a new Milgauss and a new Explorer 2. But here's the thing. The 1019 Milgauss, which was the model previous to our current 116400, was dropped following the 1988 model year and it lay dormant until 2007. There was a big gap. There is a Milgauss anniversary coming up mid-decade, this decade, and Rolex has no shortage of those 39 to 41 millimeter full bracelet, stainless steel, three-hand, no-date sports watches. So here's what I think. Right now, Rolex might drop one or all of the Milgauss family and just wait until 2026 for the anniversary of the watch to relaunch the Milgauss model line. That will help rebuild interest in this model line, which Collectors have begun to take for granted. This is one of the few Rolex sports watches that is generally not marked up used or waitlisted new. And frankly, it gives Rolex time to clean house and clear out the redundancies in this size, style, and price point within their own catalog. So I would not be shocked to see the Z Blue or all of the Milgauss models dropped this year. Okay, now we're talking within the realm of the possible. Not things I expect to happen, but things that, ah, let's call it a one in two chance, could happen. So, despite the GMT, Sea Dweller, and the Sub all being relatively new, Rolex often continues releasing variants of given models for the lifetime of a given model generation. So if I had one wish, it would be for a fusion of this and this. A full bracelet, full platinum, and spectacular first ever series production Rolex Submariner. There has never been a series production sub in platinum, and that would be a famous first. But here's the thing. That watch would be so special and so spectacular, even if Rolex renewed every other model line this year simultaneously, all people would be talking about would be the Platinum Sub. So, I expect this for 2023 in two years' time and the 70th anniversary of the Submariner. So, we could get a new Daytona in 2023, or we could get a new Submariner. Which one do, ex do I expect? That's really hard. We might get a version of both. And that will be one hell of a model year in which I don't expect Rolex to launch an all new model family of any kind because the anniversary sub in platinum and the anniversary Daytona, which could be anything, are going to suck all the oxygen out of the room. Right here, Edward Ledden asking for a platinum sky dweller. That would be monstrous. Could you imagine that thing? Full platinum, full bracelet, ice blue dial. I am just dying. My heart skips a beat. We've got Gareth W. saying green dial Daytona. I would love to see a green dial Daytona. That would be the coolest Daytona ever made. And I'm currently hung up on the Sodalite dials and the Platinum watch. Let's see what else you guys are talking about right here. We've got Andy Gee. Greetings, Tim, from London, England. Thank you for staying up late with me. And then we've got uh, Veliki the Metals joining in. Uh, Veliki the Metals joining in from Denmark, staying up late with me in continental Europe. And then... Anglika saying yellow gold green dial sky dweller. So like the anniversary GMT full yellow gold with the matte green dial. That would be very cool. Again, a monstrous machine. Wolfgang Kullerer, let's see, what's he saying? Ah, Wolfgang, I missed your prior comment. I always like to read what Wolfgang's saying because he is a regular on the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook group. And then we have Keystar G60 saying the pricing strategy of the Cellini line has always seemed strange to me. And uh, you know, I've, I've got to agree with you right there. The watches should either be a whole lot more attractive or a whole lot more affordable, and they should consider making them in base metals. Look, what is the hottest dress watch on the market right now? It is the base metal Chronomet Blue. It is not a precious metal watch. Okay, so within the realm of the possible, guys, Rolex is not immune to fashion. More green dials are very much possible. And that's a recent example, but have you noticed 
that green dials are becoming a thing. No? Here's your clue, guys. This was foreshadowed. All right, green is the Rolex corporate color. They have a company within the Rolex empire called Roladeco that does nothing but design this kind of decor for Rolex boutiques. Now, green is a very Rolex color, and it has been for a very long time, since long before it was fashionable. But here's the thing. We're seeing an alignment of the celestial bodies with Rolex's favorite color and market trends coming into sync. So what do I expect? I expect Rolex to give us some green dials, and they started doing it last year with the Oyster Perpetuals. So. Green, of course, being the Rolex corporate color, they have not been loath to use it on anniversary models, including the 2003 anniversary sub, subsequently nicknamed the Kermit, and the 2005 GMT anniversary dial, which is gorgeous. So, we may very well see some sort of anniversary Explorer 2 launched with either a matte green dial, green infill within the bezel, or a green 24-hour hand and a green Explorer 2 script. Any of these things could happen, or Rolex could take a completely different watch model, maybe even a Cellini, and decide to supercharge it with a little bit of voguish color, which, by the way, would be a pander that I can get I can get on board with, I can endorse. I would absolutely love it. It's like I still love blue watches, even though they're played out. A green Rolex, even if it's an absolute, an absolute sop to the fanboys. I'm a fanboy. Guilty as charged. Okay, now, more sports watches on straps. Not only do I expect this to happen, it really needs to happen. So here's the thing, we have Yacht Masters and Daytonas on straps. So Rolex is already committed to this idea, even on precious model flagship watches. Aftermarket rubber looks great on modern Rolex watches. And I've got to think that the folks in Geneva have seen stuff like this from Rubber Bee and Everest, and they have to admit it looks awesome. It's great, it's stylish, it looks OEM, and there's no reason why Rolex couldn't or shouldn't offer a configuration just like this on many different models, not just the Milgauss. The only remaining question concerns how far Rolex cares to extend availability of the Oyster Flex strap bracelet and whether the company would go so far as to offer a true strap, not just the rubber-clad metal band called Oysterflex. So, DeLuca straps, and giving them full credit for this right here, proves how compelling a true leather strap on a Rolex sports watch can be. It's really good looking. It's a little bit vintage, it mixes sports and dress watch aesthetics well, and it makes a sports watch a lot more versatile. It might even solve the problem of where Rolex can find a compelling dress watch. Hint, Rolex, a lot closer than you think. Now, how about full gold sports watches with leather straps as a replacement for Cellini? It's a really good look. You give me a yellow gold Submariner on an integrated leather strap and I can show you the most desirable dress watch Rolex has ever made. So keep the moon phase in the collection or even better, Throw that moon phase in some sort of a date just body, launch it on a black alligator leather strap with a folding clasp, and if you want to really impress us, a display case back and a manual wind movement. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, the current Daytona on Oyster Flex rubber looks like a better option for formal attire, dress watches, frankly, than the mundane Cellini line of the moment. Let's go back to that Daytona. That's a better option if you want to go out on the town, black tie, again, ZZ Top style, black tie. I love that song. But that's a great dress watch. You put that on leather Rolex and you've got a segment leader. Okay, now let's talk about Rolex expanding the use of its Oyster Flex strap bracelet to improve market interest in two traditionally weaker versions of strong model lines. So you know the Submariners and the Daytonas that people are loath to buy that always resell for the least money, model lines such as the two-tone Submariner and the steel gold Daytona. There's a reason Rolex now gives this watch out at the 24 Hours of Daytona. They want to promote it, and when Rolex needs to promote a version of the Daytona or the Submariner, you know there are issues with volumes, and Rolex would like to sell more. The other ones, they sell themselves. They're waitlisted and they're marked up ridiculously on pre-owned exchanges. But two-tone? Folks just aren't that into you. But here's the deal. You throw these watches on Oysterflex and all of a sudden it's a completely different look and a completely different market proposition. The equation, the game changes Rolex. If you put a two-tone sub or a two-tone Daytona on the Oysterflex, all of a sudden you've got an entirely new weightlisted front of model line orders. 
That's not necessarily a great thing in and of itself, but it will help everyone by taking some of the pressure off the wait lists for the steel and full precious metal versions, which right now are oversubscribed. So take a version that's not terribly popular right now, make it more so, and that benefits everyone, from the guy who's going to buy the Oyster Flex two-tone to the guy who is waiting two years for a steel Daytona or a steel Submariner, now perhaps 18 months or 20 or 12 months. It's better. It's not great, but it's better, and you've fixed every problem in part by making the two-tone watches available on Oyster Flex straps. It would also follow Rolex's general practice of launching models and features first on flagship watches like the full gold Daytona, like the 42 millimeter white gold Yacht Master, and then later trickling them down to two-tone and steel. This is something Rolex has been doing for a long time. From the 2005 GMT to the original 2012 Skydweller, Rolex always launches new stuff on the expensive watches first. So I I can expect that we will see Oyster Flex on two-tone fairly soon, and the sub and the Daytona are natural landing pads. So viewer wrist shots number three, I asked, you answered, your analog on my digital Taylor from Florida, and his Omega Aquaterra have unseasonably cool 59 degree weather. I got to be a little bit jealous there in Pennsylvania here in the Northeast Taylor. Don't taunt me like that, please. Wolfgang K of Austria shares his Jager LeCoult Master Compressor Memovox, Navy Seals, and his Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook Group Club mug. A handful were made, I think it was 12, if I'm correct. Jonathan G is a man after my own heart with his heirloom Chrono Swiss Delphus Jump Hour Retrograde and Caffeine. I love that shot. Stephen F. and his Rolex Explorer 2 look at Manhattan's east side from Roosevelt Island. You can see the UN further down the stream if you look down the East River right there. That's a view rarely seen of the east side. Grant M. of Prague in the Czech Republic revs to redline with his Oyster Perpetual 41 Coral Red and his Porsche Boxster S. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on my box. All right, let's see what you guys are saying right here. MCC Le Chinois, two-tone on oyster strap. I like that idea. And then Mark S. saying, at Blue Shirt Buddha, I don't mind straps, but I don't want to see bracelets go away decontented. I don't want them to go away, but I would like a lower-priced option if the strap is included. Otherwise, please, Rolex, at least make it an option we can get as an accessory. Brick Lane saying, certainly certain watches just look great on strap. And then Wolfgang is saying, my Sky Dweller equals trendsetter. I'm not going to argue there. That's probably the most versatile overall watch Rolex makes. Rooted Rotor saying, I love the two-tone root beer and bluesy, but on a Daytona, not so much. Guys, here's a crazy idea. When have you ever seen a precious metal Explorer 2? When have you ever seen a two-tone? Explorer 2? The answer is never. I observed just before the 2018 launch of the next generation GMT Master 2 that there had never been a rose gold GMT Master in series production, and there had never been a series production rose gold and steel two-tone GMT Master in series production. So don't be shocked if as part of the festivities for the 50th anniversary, Rolex does something we've never seen before, like including precious metal on an Explorer 2 or including an Oyster Flex strap option, maybe even on that same precious metal Explorer 2. And if that happens with a green 24-hour hand, I will die. How awesome would that be? A green 24-hour hand and green dial printing, matte black dial, rose gold case, Oyster Flex straps. Oh my god, I'm dying. That would be awesome Rolex. I realize hours to go here, but if you could prototype that or at least Photoshop what it would look like, I would be most grateful. Okay, crazy theories. My Rolex predictions for 2021. This is all the pie in the sky nonsense stuff. Put on your tinfoil hats and keep a lookout for UFOs. All right, so here's where we venture off the beaten path. I feel pretty good about the predictions I've made up to this point. But now, in the interests of fun, we're going to speculate about awesome things that probably aren't going to happen in the real world. Like, that's awesome. That'd be great. Not in my city, but hell, that would be good TV. Probably not going to happen. Not impossible, but it's like 99.9% .9 this is not going to happen. Whereas some of these Rolex, eh, who am I kidding? All of this stuff is unlikely to happen. We're as likely to get a fight between Kong and Godzilla. But 
This is fun stuff. Rolex has patents filed both in Europe and in the United States on all of the following, any of which could work their way into a Rolex watch because the idea is protected internationally and thus further along in its conception than if it were just patented either in Switzerland or Europe. So, a triple split chronograph. Lange has done it. Rolex has a patent for it, splitting the seconds, the minutes, and the hours, all three of them, in the world's most advanced retropont system. A split second, split minute, split hour, Rolex has the capability, and I know they have the idea, the bug is already in the brain. Second, an atomic wrist clock using the Raman effect. Now, there are radio receivers that you can buy for your wrist that are keyed to atomic clocks. But Rolex has conducted research into self-contained atomic clocks that will fit on the wrist. That's very different from a radio watch. That's a self-contained atomic clock that presumably would lose a second over the course of centuries. Is it going to happen? We know Rolex is thinking about it. It's not likely. But again, the idea is there. And let me add that if you trace the patent paper trail for the Yachtmaster 2, Rolex was filing patents on a similar idea, albeit with a quartz base movement, as far back as 1989. So never say never. And enamel dials. Rolex actually sold quite a few of them in the middle of the 20th century. And Rolex not only has a patent on an enameling process for dials, but the Cellini moon phase actually features a small version of enamel on its moon display. There's also a little bit of meteorite, but there's already some patented Rolex enamel on a current production watch. Could Rolex go full dial, perhaps in a Hail Mary attempt to take Cellini way up market and impress with artisanal virtue that we haven't seen on Rolex watches in generations? It could happen. Also, unlikely but not unprecedented, a revival of Rolex limited editions. I got your attention there. Unlike Nutella, which has many limited editions, Rolex has only ever had three, maybe four. First, there was the original Datejust in 1945, the first 100 examples of which were considered to be a discrete edition. Second was the 1964 King Midas in white gold and yellow gold, which was made in an individually numbered series of 1,000 pieces. And contrary to popular belief, was not designed by Gerald Genta. But the 1970 reference 5100 Beta 21 quartz, Rolex's first quartz, that was designed by Gerald Genta. It was a 1,000 piece limited edition, again in white gold and yellow gold, very special, foreshadowing the integrated bracelet geometric case design that Genta would later deploy throughout his most famous works of the 70s. And it's possible that there was also, and it's not clear here, but six to eight day date Oyster Quartz cased, mechanically powered, platinum reference 1831s were made. They were made for the Shah of Iran to give out his gifts. Six to eight of these were made. It's not clear if this is just a rare watch or if the limited edition was intended, but I'm going to put it out there because it's a cool factoid. This was made right at the end of the line around 1977, just before the proverbial hit the fan in Iran. Where are all those eight today? Who knows? An interesting question, but not as interesting as the question of whether or not Rolex might revisit limited editions starting this year. How about Rolex? For 50 years of the Explorer II, a 50-piece limited edition Rolex 16550 tribute watch, 50 pieces for 50 years to be allocated by lottery to clients rather than weightless priority with the money going to a good cause like let's say COVID relief. That would be one hell of a splash and the ultimate return by the ultimate watch brand to the world of limited editions. But I asked and you answered. I know what's coming up and it's viewer wrist shots number four. I predict Hector R frames his first Grand Seiko, a GMT SBG J201 with his favorite morning grind. Clark captures the elegance of his white gold white dial, Rolex Day Date 40, topical and timely, looking good, Clark. Tom B introduces his Squale 50 Atmos, and Lewis, the Bernadoodle. That is a designer breed I didn't even know existed. George B of Belfast joins us with his Bucherer Blue Edition Breguet Marine, of which perhaps only 30 examples were made. That is killer. That is a great modern marine, by the way. And Ron H dares to be different, 
with his D. Dornbluth and Zona regulator watch. There is a brand we don't see too often on the show, and it looks spectacular. Thank you, Ron. Adam S. concludes this Rolex intensive show with his Submariner, Catch an Air, and the Chicago Nightlife. That is a lovely urban shot. Guys, watches and wheels, watches and dogs, watches and whiskey, I don't care. Send me your watches to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on my box. And don't forget to join me for the after party. Join my Facebook group, Talking Time with Tim Masso. This week, lots of live events. We're going to be talking live, you and me, with no program but interaction, 5 p.m this Wednesday, and we're going to be reflecting on that with Rolex Hath Rod. Thank you to my studio audience. I got Josh, I got Sean on the switcher, and I've got you, the best audience on YouTube. Time out, Tim out, watches and wonders to come, and thanks for logging on.